work over here. Okay, so we are happy to have the Abhijit Gate from Piaco. He's going to tell us about the modularity of supersymmetric partition functions. Please. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Satoshi, for uh, your invitation. And um, very happy to talk about uh, the, this, uh, this thing that I worked on recently. So the talk is going to be about uh, modular properties of supersymmetric partition functions in higher dimensions. Okay. The ideas presented in the talk are uh, quite general and it seems that they would be generalizable even to non-supersymmetric theories, but uh, it's most, uh, you know, it's easiest to make things concrete in the supersymmetric case. So that's what I will stick to in the talk. Uh, and mainly supersymmetric theories in four dimensions. Okay. So as you all know, uh, uh, modular properties of two-dimensional two uh, partition functions of two-dimensional conformal theories have played an important role. And you know, the modular by that by that I mean when you compute the partition function of a conformal field theory on a two torus, uh, it enjoys the invariance under the large diffeomorphism group of the torus, which is SL2C, which is a pretty large group. And uh, thanks to the constraints imposed by this invariance, um, we get, for example, the celebrated for Cardi formula which relates the density of operators at high energies to the contribution uh, to the, of the identity. Now, uh, apart from the Cardi formula, the modular bootstrap in two dimensions has been effective in imposing bounds on the gap between the first excited state and the vacuum and so on. So in that sense, uh, two-dimensional modular invariance has played an important role in constraining the space of conformity in two dimensions. Now, we know that CFTs in higher dimensions obey constraints uh, of unitarity and crossing, uh, but then the natural question is, uh, are there any other constraints uh, that we are missing? Constraints uh, akin to perhaps the two-dimensional modular invariance. So, if one wants to study um, you know, properties such as modular invariance in higher dimensions, as I said earlier, one should think of uh, the partition function of conformal field theory on a manifold which has a large diffeomorphism group, as a big large diffeomorphism group, okay? Because the large diffeomorphism, large diffeomorphism group of T2 was SL2Z. So here also one would be tempted to consider the partition function on D torus, let's say. The large diffeomorphism group in that case would be SLDZ. It's a pretty big group, but, uh, but this doesn't quite let us do what we want to do, namely to constrain the spectrum of operators. Because as you know, the state operator map is only valid for the Hilbert space on S D minus one. So only on the Hilbert, only for the Hilbert space on uh, the sphere, do you have the state operator map. So only the, the partition function that you would really want to constrain in order to constrain the operator spectrum is the partition function on S one times S D minus one. Um, now for D equals to two, of course, this is the familiar torus and has large, uh, uh, as a big large diffeomorphism group. But for D equals three, uh, this manifold is S1 times S2, and the large diffeomorphism group is uh, Z2 times Z2. Okay, so it's a very small group. Uh, you know, if you want some understanding of this group, this Z2 times Z2 essentially is uh, uh, an antipodal antipodal map uh, for S2 as well as S1, and there is a, another element having to do with the um, uh, non-simply connectedness of the diffeomorphism group of S2. So as you go around S1 this map could change and make a non-trivial cycle uh, in, the non, uh, in the large diffeomorphism group of um, S2, okay? So that's your Z2 times Z2. But as you can see, it's a very small group. So perhaps it's not as constraining. It's safe to assume that it's not going to be as constraining as SL2Z. Um, now, uh, Z2 times Z2 is probably also the large diffeomorphism case for D, uh, the large diffeomorphism group for the case of D equals four. Um, so again, this is going to be small. For higher D, uh, no one knows the large diffeomorphism group of uh, SD minus one times S1 type of manifold. But it's perhaps safe to assume that's going to be a, a, a small, in particular, a finite group compared to SL2C. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we don't have uh, any modular invariance? Should we abandon all the hope of finding modular invariance in higher dimension? Well. There is a hope and it comes from a very unexpected place. There is a very special mathematical function called the elliptic gamma function, which enjoys the property that I have written here. Okay. 
and it just so happens that the elliptic gamma function is also the superconformal index of a chiral multiplet in four dimensions. Okay, so in particular, the superconformal index means it's a partition function on S3 times S1. And um, there is a way of understanding this property as a covariance under uh, the group SL3Z. So what business does a partition function on S3 times S1 have being covariant under SL3Z? So in particular, SL3Z is a large epimorphism group of three torus. So in particular, where is this three torus in this geometry? And where is this property coming from? So in the rest of the talk, we will try to answer this question. And in answering this question, we will discover a more general property, you know, a property, a similar property that is valid more generally to partition functions of all theories, supersymmetric theories in four dimensions. So before we do that, let's look at uh, the two dimensional case, uh, case a little more closely. Um, and because we want to restrict ourselves to the discussion of four dimensional supersymmetric cases, let's look at the supersymmetric, uh, let's look at the modular uh, invariance of supersymmetric theories in two dimensions. So the supersymmetric partition function in two dimensions, say of uh, two comma two supersymmetric theories. Now this partition function is known as the elliptic genus. It has been studied extensively in the literature. Um, it is best to define it in the RR sector. Then one hopes to have invariance under the full SL to Z. If you did, if you define it in some other sector, then you would uh, expect invariance only under a, 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 a finite index subgroup of SL to Z. Now, um, yeah, this is the definition. As you can see, this is just a trace of a trace with minus one to the F inserted, um, which measures the R charge in the left moving sector and the L naught dimension in the left moving sector. Uh, geometrically speaking, this tau is the complex structure parameter and Z is the holonomy of the, the background holonomy of um, um, the R symmetry gauge field. Now, of course, uh, this theory could have other symmetries, other global symmetries. In that case, you would introduce holonomy associated with those global symmetries as well, which would make the partition function Z, not just function of Z and tau, but the ZI and tau, where Z would be, um, the number of Zs would be equal to the rank of the global symmetry, uh, plus uh, this R symmetry, if you wish. Um, now, so far, in our discussion, we talked about the large diffeomorphism group, which is SL to Z, but we would like to talk about uh, large gauge transformations in the same footing as well. So in this case, the large gauge transformations are generated by shifts of this holonomy Z by one and by tau, okay? Uh, so which would, which would make the group of large symmetries, meaning group of large transformations, both the diffeomorphisms as well as uh, large gauge transformations, uh, equal to SL2Z, a semi-direct product, uh, Z squared. Now this is a semi-direct product because SL2Z acts on Z squared. Now if this were, sorry, if this were, um, if, if there were many holonomies, ZI, then this group would be SL2Z, semi-direct product, Z squared, to the power R where R is the rank of the global symmetry. And the action, just to summarize its action on the parameters, if you know, focusing on the case of R equals one, is simply this. This is just the familiar action on tau of the SL2Z part, and this is the shift action on Z of the Z squared part. Okay, so I hope uh, this uh, discussion is clear. Now, the modular property of the partition function can be succinctly written as follows. So you have a partition function Z evaluated at Z and tau and is related to the partition function evaluated on the G inverse image of the parameters. And it's not exactly the same. It's it's same up to some phase, okay? But this phase is important because you cannot get rid of this phase. You cannot define Z, partition function Z to Z prime so that uh, this phase goes away. You cannot absorb this phase away in the definition of Z prime, you know, which makes this phase a signature of anomalies. You know, anomalies are something that cannot be gotten rid of by the local counter terms. And that's what we are seeing here. Now, as a consequence of this equation, so just using this equation, you can show that this phase obeys this condition here. Okay. And this is very easy to check. You know, you write e to the i phi g is equal to z divided by the, this side, and you put it in, and you see that things cancel, and you simply have this equation. So this equation is sometimes called the first group cocycle condition. Okay, so this this phase obeys this cocycle condition. Now, 
here I just stress the fact that they are indeed the anomalies of the theory because you cannot get rid of them by local by redefinition of partition functions. Another way to see that is, uh, you know, the way you would compute these phases is by considering a mapping cylinder like so. So you have a torus of these you know, parameters and you have another torus with the parameters related to this one by a large uh, transformation. You know, by G, I'm including both uh, diffeomorphisms as well as uh, gauge transformation. So together, I'm just calling it a large transformation. And in this mapping cylinder, if you evaluate uh, classically the three-dimensional uh, anomaly chun uh, the three anomaly chun Simons anomaly three form, then you would get this phase e to the i phi g. Okay. Um, now, okay, so this is not really essential. Let me move on. Uh, there is a way of seeing that um, this phi g cannot really be absorbed into z without just doing trial and error. There is a way of seeing that this phi g indeed is some non trivial phase that just cannot be removed using this uh, here, but let me not talk about it. Okay, but uh, as a consequence of this equation, you can see that uh, this phi, once you compute this phi for G, which is the generator of uh, the group of large transformations, then using this equation, you can compute it for all group elements. Okay, just from this equation, because it's telling you what is the phi for G1, G2, once you know for phi for G1 and phi for G2. So once you know them for the generators, you know what this is for um, their products. So you can define the partition function in such a way, this phi g is a zero for all the generators, but two. And these are the two generators. This is the group element S, the standard S model of the transformation. And this is a large gauge transformation, which is the shift by tau. Okay, so only these phi's are non-zero, the rest are zero. So you can define the partition function in this way. Now, the meromorphic function, meaning the partition function that obeys this uh, property with uh, phi s and phi t tau being these and the rest being zero is known as the Jacobi form of weight zero and index c over six. Okay, and uh, this is a classic uh, subject in mathematics and it has been studied to a great extent. Um, now, how much is known about uh, classifications of these Jacobi forms, I'm not an expert, but I think what is known is that um, for index that is integer, uh, the dimensionality of the space and how to parameterize it, et cetera, is, is known. Um, so, you know, people, experts in the audience could correct me, uh, but, but I think that is what is known about, about, about uh, the space of uh, St. Jacobi functions. Now, if we had more uh, fugacities or more holonomies, um, then uh, this would be a more involved problem. You would have these phases, which will be function not just of uh, Z, but ZIs. And then it would be an interesting problem, which I don't think has been uh, discussed in this classic context. Similarly, for 0, 0,2 supersymmetric theories as well, you would have a similar problem at hand. And uh, you know, a more general form of these phases is obtained. But, but nevertheless, you can ask this question. You can ask this question that, you know, let's say there is a function z which obeys this condition. And you know all these e to the i phi g's. And I just told you how you compute them. You compute them by considering a mapping cylinder mg, let's say, and evaluating the uh, churn simons anomaly 3 form on it. And then you can ask, what is the space of solutions to this equation? Once you know e to the i phi g, how many, you know, what is the dimensionality in particular of this space and how do you parameterize this space? And now, if you think that the elliptic genus is a good stand-in for a 0, 0,2 supersymmetric theory, meaning that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, then this question here can be thought of as a bootstrap program. Given that, uh, you know, the, the, the theory has certain uh, anomaly, which is what is en encoded here in this phase, then what is this, what kind of elliptic genus can it have? So that's the kind of question you can ask here. And as I said, this has been answered to some extent uh, for a particular, um, you know, in this context of uh, Jacobi, Jacobi forms. Okay. So now uh, let us develop some mathematical vocabulary, which will let us, um, uh, which will help us in uh, analyzing and stating the results of the four dimensional case as well. So the partition function, as I said, is a, some meromorphic function of these parameters, z and tau. 
So let the space of such functions be n, and uh, the other space that is relevant is the space of phases. Okay, or more uh, precisely, space of nowhere nowhere vanishing holomorphic functions, and those phases be m. Okay, so again, n is some meromorphic function, and m is some phases. So as I said, this phase belongs to uh, phi, and the partition function belongs to n. But as I said, you can multiply it by arbitrary phase. So it actually belongs to n mod m. Okay. Now the equation obeyed by this phase, as I said earlier, is known as the first group co-cycle condition because you know. Uh, and now you can find a trivial solution to this condition, of course, that you can just take e to the i phi g is equal to you know this particular combination here, chi minus chi of g inverse. And you put it in here, and you see that it's everything is cancelled, and this condition is immediately satisfied. But if that were the case, then you could make all the phases go away by redefining the partition function. And since this is not possible, the e to the i phi g is not simply this. In other words, it's not simply a co-boundary. So this says that this is, if you think of this as a form, this 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 is telling you that this form is closed, and this is telling you that it's not exact, which makes it a non-trivial element of group cohomology. So I'm not going to go into the details of defining this precisely, but I just want to give you an intuition as to why this is a non-trivial element. Okay, because it obeys the post-cycle condition, but it's not simply a co-boundary, which makes it a non-trivial element. So sometimes you would say that e to the i phi g is a non-trivial element of the first group cohomology, um, valued in M, which is the phases. This G2D is simply the SL2Z uh, semi-direct product uh, Z squared. That I talked about earlier. Now this this is the first group cohomology because uh, because this phi g has one group label g. So this is this if you wish you can think of this as a index or the degree of the form g. The second you know if you want to you know, two form would be a, a thing with two labels of g here. A three form will be a thing with three labels of g here. And if they were to correspond to the non-trivial elements of group cohomology, then you would then you would denote them by h2, h3, and so on. Okay, so this is what we learn from the discussion uh, of two-dimensional uh, modular invariants of elliptic genera, and 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 moreover, once you once you realize that this is a an non-trivial element of the first group cohomology, um, it automatically makes uh, the partition function itself, which belongs to n mod m, a non-trivial element of the zeroth group cohomology. So this is because you cannot quite uh, redefine this away. You cannot quite get rid of this phase by redefining the partition function. Okay, and it's zero because it doesn't have any group label G here. Okay, that's why it's zero. Now, with this vocabulary, we can state the result. Um, we can state the result um, in 4D. Okay, any questions so far before I move to 4D? I have one question. Um, yes. So this. N is a space of minimal function, which is infinite dimensional, right? Yes. M is also space of phase. Is it also infinite dimensional? Yes, it is infinite dimensional. And how about N mod M? Is it also? Yeah, yeah it's also infinite dimensional. Okay, so it's a group, uh, the infinite dimensional group cohomology. Uh, no, 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 no. So the group of group cohomology is this guy here. Okay. okay. So that's the group part of this. And oh, this I is see. just the coefficient. Coefficient. Okay. This okay. Okay. This okay. Is, these are the space. These are the fields in which these actually the more rigorously you know you think of these as G modules because they are not simply mm -hmm. field fields, but but you what is important is the action of G on this oh, space also. I so see. that I already described how how G acts on Z and tau. You know, mm -hmm. if you want, I can go back. I see. Uh, this action I here. Okay. So whatever this space is, it enjoys an additional property, namely it gets acted upon by this G, which mm -hmm. makes it a module. So group okay. homology is something which you find with the coefficients in some group module. Okay. Uh, 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 okay, I understand. Thank you very much. More questions? Okay, if not, let me go ahead. So in four dimensions, uh, as I said, uh, this vocabulary lets us state things uh, very, um, you know, immediately and clearly. 
uh, and it's good to have this in front of your eyes so that uh, one can see what, where we are going to go. So as I said, what we will do is we will consider 4dn equals 1 supersymmetric theory with global symmetry of rank R and we back, turn on background holonomy for each of these global symmetric carbon generators. Now, the result is that they are non-trivial elements, the partition functions are non-trivial elements of the first group homology. Here in the two-dimensional case, the partition functions were element of the zeroth group homology, the phases were element of the first group homology, but in four dimensions, the partition functions are the elements of the first group homology. Again, the group here is SL3Z, I will, I will explain why, why it is this group and I will, I will explain basically this side. The, the entire talk is going to be the explanation of this slide here, the just results. But here the group is SL3Z semi-direct product Z cube to the power R. R is because there are R uh, holonomies and uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's element of H1, in particular it obeys the first group cycle condition like so. And this is only up to a phase because it's mod M, so let me add a phase here. So as you can see, this equation here is very similar to the equation obeyed by the two-dimensional uh, partition function, but it's one higher level, okay? Because, because you see, this partition function obeys the equation that was obeyed by the phases, but, but modulo a phase itself. And now you see the phase has two um, labels of the group element, okay? Now, because this has uh, two uh, labels of the group element and, and also from the, you know, by virtue of this equation, you can see that these phases obey this equation. And this equation is nothing but what is called the second group cocycle condition. And because you cannot quite absorb all these phases away into the redefinition of Z, that means this phi is not simply a co-boundary, okay? And that makes this an element of the non-trivial element of the second group homology. Okay, and, uh, and, and it makes the partition function the non-trivial element of the first group homology. Now there is a caveat in the, all this, and the caveat is that the Z that I denote here, and the things that are going to be the non-trivial element of the H1, are not quite the supersymmetric partition functions, but something that are very closely related to supersymmetric partition functions. Okay, so this is just the, the bigger picture, or the, the result that we are, want to get at. Um, I, 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 I stated it to begin with because with the vocabulary that we had, we could state it very easily. And I hope uh, it's clear, at least the analogy of this result with the two-dimensional result is, is clear. You know, this is essentially one higher level version of the two-dimensional result. The partition functions belonging to H1, the phases belonging to H2, as compared to partition, belong to, partition functions belong to H0 and the phases belong to H1. Is this clear? Okay. Yes, yes. Good, thank you. Um, now, okay, so, so what does this tell you? This tells you that if you know the partition function, so, so again, I haven't quite explained why is it that these partition functions have a G label, and that, is, that I will certainly do. But, but, but this, this equation tells you that if you know the partition functions uh, with labels that are generators of this group, then you can compute partition functions with any other label using this first group of cycle condition, but where are the constraints? You know, this just tells you that you can make another thing using the two things that you know. But of course, the generators obey relations. So you can evaluate this first group of cycle condition on relations, and then you have your constraints that the partition function must obey, something like the modular invariance. So indeed, so SL3Z turns out that it has an element Y, which cyclically permutes. So if you think of the SL3Z as a three by three matrix, acting on a three-dimensional vector, then it has an element Y, let's say, which cyclically permutes these three entries. Very similar to S element of SL2Z, which also cyclically permutes, but with an additional minus sign. But in SL3Z, there is no minus sign. A thing without minus sign is already had determinant one. So, so, and things with one additional minus sign would have determinant minus one. So anyway, so there, there is this Y, which cyclically permutes all these th entries, uh, so in particular, it obeys y cube equal to one. And now you evaluate this co-cycle condition on this relation and you get this equation. So you get zy, you know, because the only group element that appears in this relation is just y, 
you just get a constraint on zy this is the constraint and i have set it to be equal to not quite one but equal to some phase you know because this equation as i emphasized is valid only up to phases so i i have, I have, I have set some phase here now in principle of course this phase is computable using you know you in the same way that you computed the the phase in the two dimensional case in the two dimensional case it was computed by uh, computing the anomaly uh, chern simon three form on the mapping cylinder in this case it is going to be a very similar type of computation where uh, you would compute anomaly chern simon five form on a particular manifold that we will talk about later but in nevertheless this is a phase that can be computed but instead of computing we just conjecture this to be uh, almost equal to the anomaly polynomial of the theory you know there is a way so there is a detailed conjecture about what this phase must be in our paper and now uh, for chiral multiplet now let's see the consequence of this equation so in addition to this equation there are some other constraints also that zy must satisfy but for chiral multiplets the zy is exactly the supersymmetric quadratic function on s3 times s1 that is the super conform index now you can see the origin of the mysterious modular property that the gamma function was obeying because zy is equal to gamma you put this in here and precisely get this equation and you take this this conjectured form of p you evaluate it you know as a, the conjecture is that it's an anomaly polynomial you evaluate it for the chiral multiplet and you precisely get the polynomial q that appeared there which was a cubic polynomial in z so this uh, picture already explains where the mysterious modular property of the elliptic gamma function is coming from but a nice thing about uh, the way we are looking at this problem is that uh, the results about the partition functions are more general than to be just applicable for chiral multiplet so in particular we can apply this to uh, other supersymmetric theories and we get uh, more uh, you know then those will end up constraining the partition functions of those theories as well okay um so in particular you can also you know in two dimensions i emphasize the bootstrap kind of understanding of the problem where you think of uh, uh this uh, this this problem here you think of this problem as a problem for determining this function z where you are given e to the i phi g you know which we compute from the anomaly uh, chern simon form and then you are ask you know what is the space of this theory you just characterize the space of these functions so similarly um in this case you can also think of this problem in the same way you you are given let's say with i phi g1 g2 you know because these are something that you can compute from the anomaly polynomial and then you ask you know what is the space of functions which obey this equation so that would be tantamount to you know if if again uh, the the partition function is a good stand in for this uh, for the theories themselves then this would be tantamount among to asking if you are given a particular anomaly polynomial then what is the space of theories which has that particular anomaly polynomial so in that sense again this 4d uh, equations also lets us think about um the let us exploit this modular property and use it as a tool for bootstrap would shaping the space of theories super 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 important theory <clears throat> okay now let's get to the main uh, chunk of the talk where i will explain the results that i just stated in particular i will explain where this uh, first group cycle condition is coming from and what are all these labels g that appear on the partition functions <clears throat> now first of all let me answer where is this t3 you know because the group that we are encountering is a cell 3z um, times z cube to the power r so it's very natural to first ask where is this t3 and this comes from thinking of s3 times s1 as being glued as being obtained by gluing two solid copy you know two copies of solid 3 to us okay um this is a slightly more complicated version of a, of a more familiar fact namely s3 can be obtained by gluing two solid 2 to the right you know so here you take two handle bodies two tori and you glue them together but you don't glue the contractible cycle with the contractible cycle but rather contractible with the non contractible and vice versa and in that way you can get s3 alternatively you can think of this s3 as a torus fibration over an interval 
where one cycle shrinks on one tip and the other cycle you know one one cycle shrinks on one end of the interval and the other cycle shrinks on the other end of the interval um, this is just the equivalent way of saying this gluing okay and to this picture if you take just the direct product by s1 you get uh, this picture of uh, s3 times s1 being obtained by gluing a two solid three to five okay so here i am this is my cartoon of uh, getting this uh, s3 times s1 geometry by gluing two solid three to five so here you should think of this is a, a three torus but uh, one cycle is contractible like so and here also it's a three torus with one per cycle contractible and i'm gluing in this in this way one contractible with non contractible and vice versa now instead of just drawing this as a disc i have drawn it as a cigar because the supersymmetry is such that you know there is a topological twist i'm not going to go into details of uh, how i preserve supersymmetry and what is the exact background and so on but but uh, i'll just say that there is a partial topological twist that is being done which lets us um, lets us pull uh, lets us uh, you know make this cigar stretch this cigar uh, very long very far and make it very long and that's why i have drawn it as a cigar and uh, moreover uh, the complex structure of torus i have denoted as sigma and tau so the complex structure of three torus is labeled by two parameters sigma and tau and uh, for simplicity i have taken these uh, tori to be rectangular and then sigma and tau can simply be thought of as uh, the lengths of these circles the circumferences of these circles okay so the notation is going to be that the sigma circle is the contractible one on the left side so the left on the left we will always keep this configuration or this uh, parameterization of the solid three torus where i have a, a, a circle with length 1 a circle with length sigma which is contractible and a circle with length tau now that on the left is being glued to a geometry in this is almost the same geometry but with an offset like so now you could also glue this with an identity operator you know identity map now that you have this gluing picture you can just glue this with any diffeomorphism of this uh, t3 right so in particular you can glue this with an identity map and in, if you if you do that what you get is s2 times t2 and as i said more generally you can just glue it with any large diffeomorphism uh, which is g and while doing that large diffeomorphism you could also do large uh, gauge transformations which will introduce fluxes through various cycles Uh, but that also you could do so more generally taking g to be an element of some large transformation of the large dark transformation group you, you can construct a manifold mg with some specified uh, configuration of background fluxes okay so this is my gen cartoon for the most general type of gluing where you have this uh, space and uh, on the right you are gluing it with that but with a with a with a transformation g and the thing that results i come i'm calling mg <coughs> so the geometries involved in mg could be s3 times s1 or s2 times t2 or more generally you could produce the length spaces lpq now can you produce some more spaces also uh, i'm not quite sure perhaps you cannot um and 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 let me let me comment that uh, you know cyberg and friends have studied uh, preserving supersymmetry on these spaces and uh, they have concluded that you can indeed uh, preserve supersymmetry on these length spaces but uh, on length spaces lpq where q is 2 for example uh, you would in order to preserve supersymmetry the r charges are required to be even integers okay so we would need to consider so this whole construction would be applicable to those theories which which the, 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 which do have an r symmetry which which is an even integer which you know with which the r charges of all the fields are even integers so even if you didn't have that you could make it by combining that r you know the r symmetry that you have with some global symmetries and uh, achieving this condition okay so now because of this gluing the natural way of thinking about the partition function now as the inner product of the state so you have a state um of this half side and you have a state on this half side and this gluing to construct the partition function to construct the manifold means that the partition function is constructed by taking the inner product of the state living on this boundary with the state living on this boundary and that is what is given here so the boundary on the left comes with the parameter z tau sigma which collectively i have denoted as a tau vector 
and the state on the right is almost the same except that it has been evaluated on a different set of parameters namely g inverse acting on tau because if that is the case then under the action of g these parameters would match up and you will obtain a, a glue geometry so the partition function zg is essentially this inner, inner product here now um, so this is one observable that you can compute for the manifold mg but more generally you could uh, you know you could consider what you would call partition function matrix where you would insert supersymmetric defects at the core of these geometries so let me call this i and j and consider a matrix observable zij which is given here where i and j are some defects which which induce some other states here and here and in that way you will con con compute uh, the partition function matrix now as i alluded to one is doing the partial topological twist here okay so so before that let me say that generically the hilbert space on t3 is going to be infinite dimensional okay but because one is doing partial topological twist one can stretch the cigar very far and effectively project the state onto the ground states living on t3 and for supersymmetric gauge theory the spectrum of these ground states is finite dimensional so effectively one is only considering a finite dimensional vector space uh, living on t3 so these i and j you can only take them to be finitely many you can in fact take them to be you can only consider n types of defects where the where n is the effective dimensionality of the hilbert space living on t3 so here the supersymmetry is used crucially to reduce the infinite dimensional nature of the hilbert space t3 to a finite dimension to to to, to, to finite dimensions okay but uh, but 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 just to uh, you know anticipate uh, what i'm going to say in the, in the outlook for non supersymmetric theories this is the step that you will not be able to do in you know one would have to be content with the infinite dimensional nature of the hilbert space that lives on it but nevertheless uh, this construction you could still follow through. but but okay let's go in coming back to supersymmetric case this is the partition function matrix that you would consider this is an n by n matrix where n is the dimension to the hilbert space now instead of considering supersymmetric defects inserted at the core you could consider any other state in fact that's what will help us you will 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 not consider supersymmetric defects but some you consider other states and that would make our life easier now um so what we are, what we'll do is we'll consider an orthonormal state set of states alpha on t3 and define these states like so so this is an inner product of tau on alpha tau with alpha so so, so this is just a wave function in the alpha basis if you wish of the of the vacuum state you know the state where there is no defect and then we will compute uh, the partition function in this alpha basis so you have z g alpha beta with this and now if we use this definition then you can see this is going to be diagonal so that's already a nice simplification that the matrix that you obtain is a diagonal matrix Now the wave functions here, tau alpha, are known as the holomorphic blocks. Uh, these have been studied before uh, by Wolfgang and Yoshida, and so on. Um, and uh, and then this partition function that you obtain by gluing the two holomorphic blocks is 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 known to have an interpretation as partition function of the theory in a particular Higgs vacuum. Okay, and the Higgs vacuum also are labeled by this alpha. so these are the states that we will consider this alpha alpha basis and because they are diagonal we we'll just consider z alpha alpha and now once once we have those it's very easy to see where this uh, one cycle one co cycle condition is coming from you just simply consider the you will just simply consider the partition function on m g1 g2 which is this in the so you consider one particular diagonal entry of the matrix because it's diagonal you can just focus on single di single entries of the diagonal instead of looking at the whole matrix so this is this is understood as this inner product here and now you insert a complete set of states as i have done here and because i'm not quite using the beta you know the, just the alpha basis but rather uh, rather this basis here they are, they are not uh, uh, normalized so in order to normalize them i have to divide by the inner product and after doing so i get this equation here so you have z g1 g2 is equal to z g1 times z g2 but there is this one over this thing which is the normalization okay 
so in order to get to the cycle function that we have we define something called the normalizable normalized partition function which is this which is zg z hat g which is uh, zg divided by z1 evaluated gene gene inverse and this is the normalized partition function and it's easy to see that the normalized partition function obeys this co-cycle condition so when i said that the thing that obeys the co-cycle condition is not quite the partition function this is what it is it is first of all a thing with an alpha so it's a, it's a partition function evaluated in an alpha vacuum alpha higgs vacuum but moreover it's not quite the partition function but it's normalized partition function in this way in this way okay <clears throat> so so now moreover you know what we are obtaining here is that this is equal to this where is the phase so this phase uh, we don't see it here because we assume something that was too strong we assume that the state is labeled by these parameters tau okay that's what we assume but 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 this need not be the case you know if the you can think of this state as defined on the parameter space tau and as you move in the parameter space the phase could the state could pick up phases this is the berry connect you know due to berry connection and if this berry connection is curved then as you come back you would have picked up a phase okay so it's the the state is not quite labeled by the parameters but it's labeled by the parameters only up to a phase okay so in that sense you should allow for some phase in this equation and that's what we have done so this is this is the this is the right equation taking into account the curvature of the berry connection so now you can see that we have produced the one the first group cycle condition uh, here any questions okay everyone is hearing me right yes yes we can hear you yeah Actually, I have a question. Yes, please. You did not spell out the action of G on the parameters uh, Z tau sigma. So I understand yeah. that yeah. one tau sigma transforms like a projective vector. Um, yeah. What's the action on Z? Yeah, so the action of, on Z, the SL3Z doesn't really act on Z. The Z cube part acts on Z. So the Z cube pair part acts on Z as uh, Z going to Z plus one, Z going to Z plus sigma, Z going to Z plus tau. Okay. It's the shift action. Okay. Because it's a large gauge transformation. Sorry, I should have made that clear. Thank you. And you also have not quite uh, given the interpretation of, of these parameters in terms of the gauge theory, yeah. but now that's standard. I will, I will, I will, I will uh, actually look at the SL3Z action in detail soon. But these okay. parameters I, I have mentioned, these parameters are the geometric parameters, the sigma, tau, and so on, because these are uh, the complex structure of the torus. For now, I'm just taking the torus to be rectangular, and the sigma and tau are simply the lengths of these circles. Yes, but I guess there are chemical there are chemical potentials in the gauge theory somehow. So exactly right. Sorry. So 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 when you when you consider when you consider this geometry, you obtain S three times S one. The sigma and tau they become uh, chemical potentials for rotational rotational group. So rotational group for S three times S one is S O four. I mean the, the the group that is acting on S three is S O four, which has two cartons, and the sigma and tau are the things that couple to those two cartons, but not quite. They also couple to um, some R charge, uh, which 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 you know. Which would make um, which would make uh, the charges that these chemical potential couple to Q closed, which is important to define an index. So sigma and tau are going to be the index, uh, the, the the parameters of the the index. So so if you are familiar with the index, sigma and tau are the you know are, are you know p and q parameters of the index. P is going to be e to the power two pi i sigma, and q is going to be e to the two pi i tau. Okay, thank you. Hi, I believe I have a question. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, so, uh, just thinking that you know, the, the way that you are defining this full partition function S3 as you know some some sort of you know combined combination of two partition functions defined on these two you know three toi, and these are spaces with boundaries. So, should I think of it like this that you know by doing full partition integral, you are doing two separate partition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then joining this yeah, that is true. So that is the inner product. 
so so i'm thinking of the partition function as the inner product of these two states so the way you would evaluate this state is by fixing some boundary condition and doing a path integral and that way you will obtain a wave functional which is a state and the same thing here and then you would glue them and by that you would do a you know some over some over states here which is also equivalent to integration over all the boundary conditions that you have imposed here so right, this but you are labeling here, you, yeah, you are labeling these states are only this tau tau parameter it's it is the set of all possible boundary conditions and there is nothing else yeah so this is uh, i think goes back to this comment here that indeed you know the spectrum of states yeah. on t3 is infinite dimensional so in that sense there are infinitely many boundary conditions that you could impose but okay. because of this partial topological twist you can stretch the cigar very far Okay? okay, and if you think of this as an evolution in this direction here, of the state, okay. because of infinite evolution in Euclidean time, you get projected onto only a ground state, and the space of ground states is finite dimensional. So that's why okay. you are content with considering only finite dimension. But but yes, more generally speaking, where you don't have this partial twist, you know, in the case of non-supersymmetric theories, for example. you would have to look at all the states here which would in the wave functional language mean that you would have to consider all possible boundary conditions not just the one that is also possible okay okay and so is this topological twist thing is it a is it a choice or is it something that you necessarily have to do if you want to consider the full as three possible necessarily have to do it's it's something that you yeah. necessarily have to do so in order to consider supersymmetric partition functions on the compact manifold right you see that this is how you come this is how you get get to that background so as i said the cyber can friends have studied these backgrounds very carefully for us and if you take those backgrounds and chop it into half like so this is what you you get this partial topology okay okay thank you thank you okay so now uh, fine you 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 get the relation that was promised <clears throat> now uh, now let's go back to the holomorphic blocks for a bit <clears throat> mm, these holomorphic blocks you know are the wave functions that I, that i talked about so this zg if you think in terms of holomorphic blocks these are simply the product of the left block with the right block like so and now if you compute this for the normalized partition function then you simply get this this partition function the normalized partition function being the ratio of this b divided by b with the different uh, parameter g inverse now this equation is is tricky because this is telling us that zg is actually trivial in cohomology because zg is given by this ratio now if zg is given by this ratio the zg must satisfy this equation automatically and moreover all these phi's are absent so this is telling us that the that zg is actually trivial in cohomology and we will show actually that this is not the case that zg is not quite trivial in cohomology which means that uh, the picture of obtaining uh, partition function by gluing the holomorphic blocks is not quite true for all the group elements g okay so because zg is uh, non trivial part of non trivial uh, element of the cohomology this equation offers us a local trivialization of this non trivial element but it's not a global trivialization that means this equation is valid for some values of g but not for all values of g and we will show we will see this in an example but before we uh, <clears throat> look at this example uh, let's let's look at the let's look at the the group sl3g a little more closely so as i said this is the geometry and this g is the sl3z group element sl3z is as as, as boris correctly said that i am thinking of the sl3z uh, you know this one sigma and tau as projective representation of sl3z these are the the, the parameters of the tori like so and um, and uh, yeah so usually the sl3z is uh, or more generally sldz is presented by considering Uh, the generators to be tij where tij are the these matrices you have ones on the diagonal and uh, one on the ij entry and the rest are zero so you can define tijs like that so p1 2 3 2 3 are like so 
and the mathematical literature usually take SM3Z as being generated by these TIJs subject to some relations. Uh, now this is part of a more general presentation of SLDZ. Now in this we will uh, choose a different set of generators because we want to make contact with the individual SL2Z subgroups because that will offer us some more physical insight. Um, so what we do is we define SIJ to be the modular S matrix of the SL2Z subspace that is acting on the I SL2Z subgroup that is acting on the IJ subspace, meaning the SL2Z that is acting on this two three cycles. I'm calling it SL23, S, S23, the S, S element that is uh, the S element acting on this two cycles. I'm calling it S1. Two and and S one three and so on, and it turns out that the S L three Z can be generated by S S two three S one three and T two three. So just with these three generators, you can generate S L three Z. And we also want to generate the Z cube part. So we add to these generators a T three, which is the shift of Z by Z going to Z plus tau. I call it three because tau is the third third guy. Okay, so you know. So it's a very you know compact way of generating SL3Z. And now in this SL3Z, there is a very special subgroup that one should recognize. And this subgroup is the subgroup of large transformations of T3, which can be extended into the bulk. So in effect, it is the subgroup of those group elements, which are the large transformations, not just of the boundary, but of the entire half space, meaning not just of T3, but of the entire solid T3. If that is the case, then the wave functions associated to uh, a particular state under this special subgroup must go to themselves because this is just going to be, you know, large transformation of this whole entire geometry itself, it should go into itself. And if that is so, that means that the partition function, the normalized partition function for this H element, which is where H is the H element is this element of this special subgroup, is equal to the normalized partition function associated with the unity gluing. And this is simply one because of normalization. So this tells us automatically that whenever you have a group element H, which is not only a large transformation of the boundary, but also of the bulk then for that the normalized partition function must be one. So this immediately tells us, you know, for free, a lot of information about normalized partition functions for, for such things for H. Now, what is that H? The H uh, is, is, is actually SL2Z, symmetric product Z square squared, and it generated by this. Okay. Uh, I could give some intuition, but I'm not sure whether I have time actually. Um, uh, Satoshi, uh, how strict are we with the time? Uh, I don't know. I'm not that strict. <laughs> Maybe you can have five, five more minutes. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> then you said you are not strict. I, that's not what I expected. I thought I can just go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, uh, as you want. Okay. Okay. Let me. Let me. Yeah. I'll, I'll also try on my side to be to to cover everything. Yeah. To get to what. I want to get at. Okay, uh, so so this subgroup here is generated by these elements. But uh, the thing that I want to point out is that you see, so 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 the the normalized partition function for all these elements and their products is one automatically. And if you look here, the generators of SL3Z are all the all parts of that generators of SL2Z times Z, Z square squared except for S23. So you know the partition function, normal partition function, this is one, this is one, and this is one. So the only thing that is not part of the H is S23. So all in all, and also we know that, uh, you know, once you know the generators, the normal partition function for generators, you know all the normalization partition functions because of the first group post condition. And I also said that these must be one automatically. That means the only thing that you need to know to compute uh, all the ZGs is just this guy, Z hat S23. So this is what I say here. So the only independent normalized partition function is Z hat S23, which is nice because this is nothing but the S23 gluing. And that I said earlier is nothing but uh, the partition function on S3 times S1, which is the index. So it directly makes contact with the index. Modulo that it's uh, a particular alpha label and a hat. Now in order to relate to the physical partition function, meaning non-normalized, 
this partition function. We also need the Z alpha alpha one, meaning the partition function on S two times G two. So the result of this discussion is that the entire cohomology is being generated by this Z hat, and in turn, the partition functions that you need to know, the physical partition functions that you need to know to compute this Z hat is Z S two three and Z one. Meaning the partition function on S three times S one and partition function on S two times T two. Okay, now we are set to talk about a concrete example, that of the chiral multiplet, let's say of char R charge zero, and these things have been computed, you know, in the literature. So Z one is known to be one over theta function, like so, and Z S two three is known to be the gamma function. Now um, from here you can consider Z, you can construct Z hat. Because that just uh, this divided by this at S two three inverse uh, arguments, and so that that gives you Z hat S two three. And once you have Z hat, you can cons you can construct all of these thing all of the you construct you can construct uh, Z G for all G's. And in particular, as I said earlier, this M G is you know Z G the partition from M G, and these that the set of M G's include the length spaces L P Q with any background uh, flavor flux. So in fact, you can do this um, uh, very concretely, and you can check that uh, you can produce the partition functions for the chiral multiplet with R charge zero for all the length spaces with any background flux. I'm not given uh, any details here, but but you can just it's just very you know straightforward using the first group Poisson condition. One can one can do that. You can believe it. Now, so this is the story of constructing the things that you don't know from the things you know. How about the constraints? How about uh, you know the constraints that you that that you get from the group uh, relations, the relations on the generators? So you can either think of the generators uh, on the of the relations on S to three, or uh, instead of S to three, you can take uh, y z y to be the independent normalized normalized partition function. You know, I just swap this for this, and then you can think of constraints on y. And it turns out to be slightly convenient to do that. So let me just think of Z Y as the independent guy. And then, as I said, you know, Z Y Q B equals one condition gives me this nice uh, condition. And in addition to that, I, I get some other constraints. And indeed, uh, the elliptic gamma function, as I stressed earlier, obeys all these constraints. Um, and then this has been the fact that the the elliptic gamma function is a non-trivial element of the cohomology has been discussed in detail. In uh, in this paper by Felder and Marchinko. Now let me go back to the to holomorphic blocks and 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 demonstrate that the the gluing picture is is not something that holds for all G's. Okay, so you have this holomorphic block for chiral multiplet of charge zero. The holomorphic block is given by this particular gamma function, and here you can see that you know you would have expected the holomorphic block to be invariant under the action of edge, because that's a That's a large transformations of the whole bulk, not just of the boundary. So, in particular, um, let's say the action of T1. So that would be shift by shift by, shift of Z by one. We would have expected to be invariant, but clearly this is not invariant. Um, you can you see that using the property of the gamma function, and uh, that means that uh, the block is not respecting the large uh, diffeomorphism, large transformation properties that it must respect. Okay, so alternatively, if we construct uh, these z hats for H, for these elements, it's not one. You can just compute it like so using this block gluing prescription, and you do not get the expected result. This is one. So, so that means you know, as I, as I said, that the holomorphic block formula it offers you only a local trivialization of a cohomological non-trivial element. It's not valid globally. That is, it's not valid for all G's. Now let's move to a more non-trivial example, uh, namely the let's say supersymmetric gauge theories. And in gauge theories, um, the, uh, the 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 partition function on uh, on S three times S one, which is Z S two three, can be written explicitly as sum over Higgs vacuum, like so. And each term in this sum, meaning the partition function of the Higgs vacuum, can be thought of as two parts: one which is the perturbative part, and the one this is coming from the vortex part. Now you can show that this z hat y that I talked about is actually just the part, just the perturbative part uh, in cohomology, and that means the equations that the z y z hat y satisfies 
they must be satisfied by the perturbative part and in the gauge theory you can see that this is indeed true because uh, in gauge theory this perturbative part can be computed very explicitly in terms of the product of elliptic gamma functions and using the math, using the properties of this gamma function you can see that this 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 guy here satisfies the co-cycle condition uh, satisfies the constraints coming from the co-cycle condition okay um, this doesn't quite constrain the vortex part now yeah here i again stress the the bootstrap nature of the problem so you can again think of instead of instead of computing this index you can think of the index as an answer to a constraint a set of constraint equations and then you can think of this as a bootstrap program so so here the input to these constraint equations are these phases which are coming from the anomaly polynomial and then once you have those then uh, you you have a you set a constraint equation and then you can think of the index as a solution to this constraint uh, set of constraint equations. So this is the bootstrap program that I had stressed earlier also. Okay, so let me uh, outline one application of, uh, of this model of property. So as I said, for gauge theories, um, the uh, ZP, the perturbative part obeys the same formula that, uh, that the ZY must obey, which is this one, if you remember. And P here is the uh, polynomial that is cubic in Z. And uh, as I said, we have conjectured it to be uh, the toothed anomaly polynomial of the theory. And now let's uh, look at uh, the high temperature limit because we know that the two-dimensional modular formula uh, gives us the Cardi formula, meaning it tells us the growth of, uh, you know, it tells us the high temperature behavior of the partition function. So let's attempt to do that. So high temperature limit, we want to take the high temperature limit. So it's not quite, you know, temperature in the conventional sense because we are looking at supersymmetric partition functions but not quite the ordinary thermal partition functions but but we are doing you know so by by the high temperature uh, limit i mean the, the supersymmetric high temperature limit which is obtained by taking um, uh, this sigma and tau to be very small and from the positive imaginary direction and in this limit you can show that uh, you know this is the high temperature limit of this term and in this limit this guy and this guy both go to 1 so it directly ties the high temperature limit of this guy to the phase here. Okay. And moreover, you can also show that the, the, you know, as I said, the partition function doesn't quite just have the perturbative part. It also has the vortex part and you can show that the vortex part is subleading in this high temperature limit. And this tells you that the partition function Z, uh, you know, on S3 times S1 in the high temperature limit behaves like so plus some subleading corrections, but that leading order, you get this particular coefficient. And then this formula agrees with the formula that uh, J1 and friends had, and also uh, Dario, Martelli, and Samir, and so on, uh, they, they had. And, 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 it's, 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 and you can see that, you know, the, the, the mysterious uh, um, entropy of black hole states is kind of apparent from this formula immediately, because, um, for n equals four super young mills, you know that C and A both are equal and both go like n squared, but because the coefficients are different here, this is not, this, this cancellation doesn't quite go through and you get a factor of n squared here. And this tells you that the partition function, the high temperature limit, uh, sees an n squared, order n squared uh, free energy. Okay, so this is, a, this is a quick application of this modular formula. It gives you the supersymmetric Cardi formula. Okay, so now before I end, I will just point out a connection between, so this is kind of a, a bird's eye view of this construction and uh, looking at it this way also motivates some more conjectures and I will, I will, I will outline those uh, quickly. So what is the connection of the modular property of these partition functions and the geometry? Now in two dimensions, the partition function that we consider were on T2. But instead of thinking of that as a partition function T2, let me consider partition functions on T2 vibration over a point. Okay, so I'm just describing, I'm just writing a base here. So the partition function is, you know, T2 vibration over this point is equal to the T2 vibration on this other point. Now the label for the point is the parameters in which I'm evaluating the partition function. So the two, two dimensional equation is that this partition function is equal to this partition function except that there is a phase. And as I said, this phase can be evaluated by constructing, by computing the anomaly Chern-Simons form on the mapping cylinder. And mapping cylinder, I am again 
just giving the base of the vibration, which is a, which is an interval. Mm -hmm. And here you have a torus tau, and here you have a torus tau of with parameter g1 inverse acting on tau. And this here interval is the vibration. This is the interval on which the torus is fibered and changes the complex structure like so. And the contribution coming from this vibration is equal to i phi g. So this is the nature, this is the structure of the two dimensional modular property. In four dimensions, the T3 vibration, you know, in two dimensions, it, the, the, the partition function is computed on T2 vibration on a point, but in four dimensions, we are computing the partition function on T3 vibration on an interval. I mean, the partition function itself now has this kind of structure. You know, it's a vibration on an interval. And the phase uh, is a T2 vibration or T3. This should be T3, sorry. T3 vibration over a disk. And that you can see as follows. So you have this, uh, so first entry of this cycle is, is this guy, which is the partition function on this vibration with the G1, G2 transformation. But you can think of this uh, vibration in two steps, one with up to G1 transformation and then to G1 times G2 transformation like so. And now, again, you would construct a mapping cylinder between these two paths. And this would be, sorry. And this would be uh, the interpolating triangle or you know, two cell like so. Uh, you know, as you can see here, there's a path from G1 to G2, which is this one. And this one here is this broken path. And this is the, the configuration that interpolates between them. It's not quite a linear configuration, but it's a vibration on a disc. That's what I said, the T3 vibration over a disc. And these labels precisely describe what that vibration is. Now, because this is a torus at G1, G1 inverse parameters, this is a torus at G1, G2 inverse parameters. So this, 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 this diagram tells you. So in fact, group cohomologically, you can see that this actually describes uh, precisely the T3 vibration over a disk. And you compute, so that's a five manifold and that five manifold, you compute the anomaly transformers five form and that's your phase, this, this guy phase. Okay, and this is how you get the one, the, the cosecular condition that I talked about. Now, this picture immediately tells us what, uh, you know, what kind of conjecture one can make in higher dimension, in six dimensions. If you consider partition functions on T4 vibrations on a disk, now the partition function itself will look like so. Okay, and this should be equal. So you can break this uh, vibration up into three parts like so. Okay, and then uh, you can get the partition function associated to each part. And I've written it here. And then the configuration that interpolates between them is a tetrahedron because one face of this tetrahedron is this face. And this guy is the other boundary of the tetrahedron with this face, this face, and this face. These are the, this, this part here. And uh, this now is a seven manifold and you compute anomaly chan simons seven form on the T3 vibration over a three ball, like so, and you get this. So it, it, it lets you conjecture that the six dimensional partition functions on geometries labeled by two group elements now, which are T4 vibrations over a disk, you would need two group elements like so, obeys this particular relation, which makes the partition function a non-trivial element of the second group homology of some uh, six dimensional group, which will be SL4Z times Z4 to the power I. I again is the rank of the global symmetry. And uh, and then the phase itself will be now the third group cohomology valued in M. Okay, and in fact, you 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 can check this in a simple case where the you can check it for the case of a chiral multiplet, and the index of that is a double elliptic gamma function, and uh, it indeed obeys the constraint that would follow from this one per cycle condition. Now that's the modular property of uh, so there is a sequence of uh, gamma functions. It's a sequence of elliptic gamma functions. The one that I talked about earlier was you would call a single elliptic gamma function. This is a double elliptic and it's triple and so on. And all of them obey uh, modular properties. And, 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 and this is the origin of, I mean, this you think of this as the origin of the modular property obeyed by the double elliptic gamma function in six dimensions. Okay, so immediately offers a conjecture for 6D and I, I think this will, this, this day, you know, this requires further exploration also. It's an interesting thing to explore. Okay, so now, sorry for going over, uh, over time. Let me now just end with some outlook. This is my last slide. So as I said, this here 
um, there is this uh, condition that this perturbative part obeys and uh, there are these phases that appear e to the i phi in g2. I said that they can be computed explicitly from uh, five digit and Simon's theory and it would be interesting to do so. In the paper, what I do is just to construct, uh, to conjecture what these phases are. Uh, there is a nice way of doing that uh, by considering chiral multiplets of R charge R. Let, let's you let's you to very natural conjectures, but it would be nice to compute them directly from 5D Chan Simons theory by considering the vibrations of the kind that I mentioned, namely vibrations of this kind. You have T3 fiber on the disk in this way, and you compute Chan Simons 5D Chan Simons on that, and that will let you con construct these phases uh, directly. So it would be nice to do that. And another thing is uh, that, uh, you know, here I talked about the constraints uh, being imposed by perturbative part uh, on the perturbative part, like so. But you know, it would be nice to get constraints directly on the, you know, for the vortex part. I appeal to something else. You know, uh, the um, the two-dimensional modular invariance. But it would be nice to get a constraint directly on the S3 times S1 index, not just on the normalized index, um, which would enable us to investigate. You know, uh, so so this would be useful for considering non lagrangian theories which do not do not have an obvious interpretation of uh, higgs vacuum and then then the perturbative part and non perturbative part which do not you know the non lagrangian theories don't have this kind of a distinction so in order to make this applicable to non lagrangian theories it would be nice to you know pull these constraints together as a constraint uh, on the on the full index itself um, and then that will enable us to investigate a more refined questions on the partition functions such as the bound and the gap etc now, as I emphasized a couple of times in the talk, the construction is general and can be used for non-supersymmetric theories. The only thing is that the Hilbert space on T3 is infinite dimensional. So, um, so you, you don't have just a you know, finite dimension. This, the, 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 the set of alpha is not quite finite, but it's infinite. But nevertheless, you could project onto a particular, let's say ground state on T3 and compute uh, the wave functions of the partition functions. And, and 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 analyze whether it obeys the SL3G properties or not. I mean, it would be nice to demonstrate the SL3G properties that I talked about concretely, even for a case of free theory to begin with. And then it would be a tool for analyzing even non supersymmetric theories. Also, you know, the geometric insight that I talked about uh, towards the later part of the talk, uh, they give rise to a very natural set of conjecture, even for more general vibrations, such as you know, if you in four dimensions, if you were to consider T2 vibrations on a disk on a, on a two disk. So in, in the talk, I consider T3 vibrations on an interval, but you can consider T2 vibration on a disk. Or for in six dimensions, you can consider T5 vibrations on an interval and so on. And uh, they lead to some very natural conjectures about what kind of modular properties that the partition function must obey. In the first case, uh, I would guess that the partition function should be the second cohomology of this group. And in the in the 6D case, it should be the first group cohomology of the SL5, and when I see this, uh, when I say this, uh, along with it come very concrete set of uh, equations and uh, and a very concrete set of constraints that the partition function must satisfy. So it would be interesting to explore uh, these these additional conjectures also, uh, <clears throat> and in particular, uh, you know, understand to begin with uh, the supersymmetry, how one preserves supersymmetry on these vibrations and so on. Okay, so at this point, let me stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Um, can I ask? Uh, well, I, actually, I have two questions. So, uh, seems like you mainly utilize this element y, which keeps to one. Um, so, like, what about the constraints of coming from the other element? Good. So, as I emphasized. Um, you know, S23. So, so, so the group co cycle condition lets you compute the Zs for all group elements once you know them for the generators. Okay. And uh, using that, you would need to compute only the Z hats for the generators. But moreover, using this argument of the special subgroup H, I also argued that all but one generator. All but one generators were non were zero were, were, were just one. Okay. And that, that reduces the degree of freedom in some sense only to one guy. And that generator could be taken either as S23 or Y. 
So sometimes I took it to be S23, but but you can equivalently take it to be Y. Um, the, the, you can just go back and forth between them. So that's why the entire problem has gets reduced. If you just look at normalized part, partition functions, the entire problem just gets reduced to problem about finding Z Y Z hat Y. Once you have that, you can construct everything. But because because this is normalized partition function, if you want to go back to the physical partition functions, you you also need to know the denominator, the normalization, which is the Z one, which is the partition function S two times T two. So these are the two things that you want: the Z hat Y and the uh, partition function on uh, S two times T two. Now for the Z hat Y, uh, the constraints come from this. Evaluating the co-cycle conditions on the relations, there are many constraints. Okay, and uh, one suspects that they are very strong. And for the case of chiral multiplet, for example, they should just fix the answer to be the gamma function, and it would be interesting to explore more general solutions for more general anomalies. But that's Z hat Y story. Now, for 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 Z one, which you need to go back to the physical space, you would need to uh, appeal to the standard two dimensional modular properties because z1 is a partition function s2 times t2 so it should respect the partition the modular invariance that comes from the t2 part of the geometry so that's something that is not addressed by this program and you need uh, to go back to a more familiar program of the two dimensional modular invariance so 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 answer your question you can just focus on z hat y um, for the no, for the normalized partition functions no, for the normalized partition functions yes is this clear sorry jaiwan uh, yeah yeah but good thank you uh, another question is that like you know that for n equals 2 theories in 40 there is this yeah. uh, like voa um, like cft correspondence and there um, their sl2z seems to play some role like which acts on the chiral algebra. So what's the relation between that story and yours? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So, um, so I could say the following. Uh, if I remember correctly, you know, you, 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 of course, know more about this, but, 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 but the defects give you uh, characters of various representations of the VOA and the index, the sure index itself gives you the character of the VOA, right? Right. Um, and 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 the sure index. I think the modular property of the sure index, at least, should be coming from the modular properties that I talked about. You know, you you take you you can you consider this whole program for n equals to two and take the sure limit. In the sure limit, one of the block trivializes, and then the modular properties that I talked about should reduce to the modular properties of the sure index that one is familiar from that point of view. And then uh, perhaps also by insertion of some defects, you can think of, uh, you know, again, the same uh, uh, set of constraints coming from here, giving rise to that. I mean, the, the, the fact that it's character of the VOA and so on. I mean, again, the, the, just the modular equation that they must satisfy. Yeah, so, so this is something that is interesting to explore, I think. I don't have any more to say about that right now. Um, that can, I also, can you also get a consistent check uh, in the low temperature limit from your constraint equation? Sorry, again, please. From your constraint equation, can you get uh, something like Casimir energy? Because you uh -huh. can take a low temperature limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, right. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. But I usually think of the Casimir energy as, uh, you know, so in the two dimensional case, for example, you could, uh, you could, you could redefine the partition function and the Casimir energy appears as a part of that redefinition, right? So you, you, you can, you know, it's, 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 it's in some sense belongs to this uh, space called M, which is the space of phases and the Casimir energy belongs to that. And this classification is modulo M. So in that sense, the Casimir energy is not visible here because I'm, 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 I'm classifying the partition functions only up to, you know, you can, you can redefine this using some, uh, using these uh, local counter terms, which will give rise to these phases. Um, but, but maybe there is a more, uh, more fundamental 
significance uh, of these Kashmir energies. Uh, you know, you know, in some sense, some. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I don't really know. So, in, the, in, in short, the thing that I would like to say is that um, that this classification would be only up to phases, while the Casimir energy is precisely the thing that it's classification up to, meaning the phase. So, in that sense, it's not addressing the issue of Casimir energy. But maybe there is something more that one can say. It's also a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank the speaker, uh, the Abhijit, whatever method. <laughs> um, so, so next week, uh, I think uh, uh, Takahiro Nishinaka will talk about something about the uh, Stagraph theory at the same time um, on Wednesday. And I just leave the uh, like a uh, informal dis discussion. Uh, just stop the recording and leave the spaces for informal discussion. <laughs>